Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redeemer. We're so glad you can join us for worship this morning. As we start the worship service, if you would please stand and join me, we will read scripture from Psalms 117 together. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all people. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that you have called us here this morning. Thank you that you brought us here to sit at your feet. We are so grateful that you gently draw us into you. Quiet our hearts and our minds so that we can hear from you. Let the words that we will be singing to you now just stir in our hearts and open our minds to your presence, Holy Spirit. We want to be people of praise. So fill us so that we may overflow with worship of who you are and what you've done for us, Jesus. And we pray this through your precious and holy name. Amen. Morning, church. Let me put our hands together as we sing and worship. Sing when. When you move, darkness runs for cover. And when you move, no one's turned away.
Amen. Let's sing together. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flame. Tongues above, praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Good morning again. My name is Trisha Langowski, and I serve here on staff at Redeemer, and we're so glad that you can join us here for this worship service. Here at Redeemer, we're very passionate about connection and community, and we work, in, in, um, we work really hard at integrating this into the life of the church, whether that's through our community groups, our Bible studies, all the events that our ministries put on, and particularly on Sunday mornings with all the people that God brings through the door, we would love to be able to connect and say hello. So if you're new here this morning, or you've been coming for a while and haven't yet felt like you're really connecting to the church, we want to invite you to head over to our website at RedeemerSD.org and fill out a digital connect card. We'd love to say hello to you. Or better yet, after the service on your way out, please stop by the Welcome Connect Center. And uh, we'd love to introduce ourselves to you and hear your story and share a little bit about Redeemer as well. After, the thir after this service, we will also be having the second Sunday Young Adult Lunch. And it will be a time to have a free lunch, sit down, and connect with other people. We also will be doing a topic on friendships and families. 
And one of our elders, Pat Berger, and his wife, Amy, will be giving that topic discussion. And I've been told they promised to have you guys home before the Super Bowl starts. So join us if you can right after the service. Um, as well, if you'd like to give, you can do so online or in the offering boxes on your way out. And let's pray for the service and the offering this morning. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can come into your presence and that we have been invited in by grace and grace alone. We pray that in this time of teaching from Pastor Paul, that you will form us more and more into the image of who you are and that your spirit will lead and guide us as we come together in worshiping you and declaring your praises. Thank you for calling each of us into your presence today and may you prepare us so that we can hear from you in a way that is personal to us Father, help us to just unite and open our hearts and our hands to be ready to receive your word in its full glory and strength. May it not only resonate, but penetrate deeply into our core so that it remains fresh on our hearts and lips throughout the coming week. Your word is spirit-breathed. So we pray for Pastor Paul this morning that you will speak through him and bring gospel clarity to us. Through Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Today, there are a lot of voices and opinions on virtually everything. As Christians, how can we have resilient faith in a culture of compromise? In this series, we'll go over four vital aspects of resilient faith. So join us as we discuss the importance of being in a thick gospel community where we are deeply known and committed to one another, where we will engage God in a life of worship and centering our lives around prayer navigate through cultural issues with the timeless truths and wisdom of God's word, and strive to put our faith into action, a faith that blesses and serves the world. You'll never know when you're being recorded. Right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I want to welcome you uh, to Redeemer. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. And today we begin a new series, Resilient Faith in Our Cultural Moment. And friends, this is such an important series for us. It's such an important series for our church. As a pastor, I've been talking to a lot of people and who are struggling, either have struggling faith, who are abandoning faith, or who just have angry faith. And in this cultural moment, how do, how do we make sense of everything that's going on? And in every setting, Christianity has either affirmed or challenged aspects of culture. So one of the key questions I want us to consider is, how can the Christian faith thrive and grow in our cultural moment? How can it bless? How can it discern? How can it not be compromised? And so we're going to be kicking off the series today, and it's going to go through Easter, uh, this series. And today's one kind of considers the central question, what is our cultural moment? From a Christian lens, what is our cultural moment? And if you are here and someone has invited you, you're exploring Christianity, you can come from the lens and kind of understand, oh, what does Christianity have to say about all of the, what we see and observing and happening in, in, our, in our world? And so to do that, we're going to be reading from a passage in Jeremiah. It's an ancient text, and yet it is so relevant to help us give some guidance to our particular setting. And let me just say a couple of things. Jeremiah was a contemporary of Habakkuk. So if you joined us for the past few weeks, they literally uh, did, they were prophets in the same time, in the same area, the southern kingdom of Judah. And if you were part of our series, we saw how there was lots of evil and injustice taking place in the, in the southern kingdom of Judah. Habakkuk says, what's going on? God says, Babylon's going to come and is an instrument of justice. You can listen to the series to kind of go through his own wrestling through that. But in our reading, that's what's happening. Babylon comes and there's different stages. And the part that we're going to be reading is that they, first stage is they take a bunch of Jewish people into exile into Babylon around 597 BC. And then about 10 years later, 587 BC, Babylon comes again and they wipe out Jerusalem. They take out the temple and the, and the kingdom of, of Judah is no more. 
So that's the context we're going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 29, 1 through 7. And before we read it, the first three verses gives a lot of names that's going to sound strange, but it's giving you context for that particular time, 597 BC-ish. And then from verse 4 on is the actual message that the Lord gives through the prophet Jeremiah to the exiles. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me here. We're going to be looking at this text from Jeremiah 29, 1 through 7. Listen to God's word. Here it is. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. There was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So it said, now here's the message. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Let me just pause there for a moment. Jeremiah gives this message, says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the language of the God of the battle, the God of the army. If you received an official letter or statement from the military or for the government, you'd be like, whoa, this is something I need to perk up and listen to and not take lightly. That's how it's starting off. And so it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's the message. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This is God's word. So today, resilient faith in our cultural moment, three thoughts for us to look at. First, understanding our cultural moment. Secondly, responding to our cultural moment. And third, how to thrive and not just survive in our cultural moment. So let's look at the first one. And according to our passage, what I want us to see is this. Our understanding our cultural moment, it's this. It's Christianity on the margins. So what's happening is that a group of Jewish people are taken into exile into Babylon. And from there... They are no longer in the center of cultural influence. They are people on the margins. Because the host culture, Babylon, has a different culture, different belief system, the way they, dip, they treat different people. And that became the center. And all of a sudden, the Jewish people became a religious minority. They were on the margins. They didn't have the influence. They didn't have the power that they had. While in Jerusalem, that was all taken away. This is really key to understand, friends. Uh, the Bible speaks of this language of Christianity on the margins in multiple levels for us to grasp. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, the Apostle Peter writes to a bunch of Christians, and you know how he starts it off? He says, to the elect exiles. To the elect exiles of the dispersions of Cappadocia, Bithynia, and Galatia. And he's reminding them that the host culture is the Roman Empire. And even though it's the Roman Empire, he's saying, I want you to know that you are exiles. You are people on the margins. You don't have cultural influence and power, but you are on the margins. Let me speak to you now the truths of the gospel. In our day, how do we understand our cultural moment from a Christian lens? to kind of, kind of gauge. And again, if you're exploring Christianity, you're, you want, I want you to, this message you can hear from a Christian understanding. It's Christianity on the margins. Philip Reef was a professor of sociology at, at UPenn and an expert on Western culture. And he talks about Western culture going through three movements. The first culture is pre-Christian. And in the pre-Christian culture, obviously there's no Christian influence whatsoever. This is kind of the pagan times in which uh, there was no belief in a Christian God whatsoever. Then, it, then the second culture is, uh, is the dominant Christian influence. And so it begins to shape kind of the Roman Empire and the Western um, civilization and culture. Then it has the central, at the center of it all. And he says, we have now moved to the third culture. And it's a post-Christian culture where the Christian influence is now on the margins and it's diminished. And to understand, he says the third culture is not, a, um, it's a reaction to the second. 
It's not going back to the first culture, but it's a reaction to the second. And um, John Mark Homer, in one of his books, he gives the following illustration in kind of a tongue-in-cheek way. He says, the third culture is like an entitled teenager who doesn't want to live under the authority of his or her parents' home, but wants to eat the food and live for free. And so the third culture is saying, I don't want God, but I'm gonna, I want the values of, of the Christian culture, um, the importance of, of, of human life and dignity, the importance of, 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 of rights. Those are all Christian values. I think I want to live under that framework, but no, not the king. I want the kingdom. And so some of the dynamics then of our third culture that Reef is talking about and what's at the center and the belief systems that are there, let me just highlight a couple things. One, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a center belief of there's no transcendent reality. And so therefore, everyone is making their own values. There's no transcendent reality. Related to that, there are no moral absolutes. As one person put it, the, uh, the only moral absolute that is acceptable in our culture is to say that there are no moral absolutes because that's the one moral absolute. So no moral absolutes. Why? Because if you have moral absolutes speaking into it, that is very oppressive. That's going to limit your freedom. Who, who are you, these, um, these you know, outside forces speaking into, telling me what I can and what I cannot do? Related to that third, there's no sacred texts. There's no sacred order. There's no sacred text, whether a Bible or any other religious text. And the only sacred text becomes your own. What you think. You become the sacred text. And so the messaging that, 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 that's in place is uh, the only thing we need, the only salvation we need is to be freed from the message that we need to be saved of any sin or any outside forces. So in this cultural kind of center belief system, Christianity poses a problem. It has, an outs- uh, you know, it has a sacred text. It has an outside kind of authority speaking into it. So back in the early 90s when I was in high school, Christianity was kind of viewed as odd and strange. And kind of, if you were a Christian, you're kind of unpopular. And increasingly now it's moved to being more of a threat and dangerous. So we're moving in a, in a, in a situation where Christianity, there's no uh, social benefit to, to the Christian faith. And more, there's a social cost to the Christian faith. And so let me give you one example, and it's a big one. Sexual ethics. So the modern sexual ethic goes something like this. The modern sexual ethic goes something like this. You need to be true to who you are. No one should tell you who you are sexuality in terms of your, of your, of your sexual expression. Not even your... Um, you need to be true to who you are, even if your physio- physiological body says otherwise. And so, along with no one should be, be who, true to who you are, everyone has a right for the pursuit of happiness. Everyone has that right and to, to enjoy sexual fulfillment. How dare anyone say that, that you can't have that? And so, from that lens, in the Christian perspective, the Christian sexual ethic is, is not only very restrictive, it is viewed as very oppressive. And so, in response to that, I want to encourage you. Some of you might be empathizing with that, saying, yeah. Others are saying, "Mm, I don't know how to respond. Others have friends and family members that are wrestling through this. Wherever you are at, let me press and challenge you to every belief system has a worldview, and you got to dig into the plausibility structures of what's taking place. So, for example, behind the, the modern sexual ethic, what lies at the center behind it all is identity and fulfillment. And so identity says, be true to who I am. This is who I am. This is how I feel, regardless of what anyone else has to say. And the problem with that is a modern identity. This is who I am. I believe it's very fragile. One, if you're going to be true to yourself, you're constantly changing your your thoughts and feelings. Who you are five years from now, who you think you are, will be potentially very different from who you are now. Who you think you are now is very different from five years ago. Not only that, it constantly contradicts itself. Not only does it change, it contradicts. So I gave the illustration before of this, right? One day, I, who I am, I feel like I want to exercise and run five miles and lift weights and eat healthy. And then the very uh, next day, I feel like I need to eat that cake and brownie and all the sweets um, and make me happy. So my own self is being torn and it's constantly at battle with one another. Thirdly, once you do decide on an identity and saying, this is who I am, there's this incredible pressure, a crushing pressure 
to make it happen. The irony of it all is that people say, I need to be true to who I am. No outside social construct is going to tell me what to do. That is oppressive. But then your mind is oppressing you saying, I had this crushing way that I need to follow through with who I feel that I am. Next, there's a lot of contradictions. The contradiction of saying, everyone individually say, be true to who I am. You be you, be true to who I am. And yet the culture's message today says, you need to be true to who you are. So here's an outside culture saying those things, and then here's you saying all, all of it, and it, there's just a little, there's relativism kind of taking place. It's circular. So to that, here's the, the Christian sexual ethic, what it's talking about. Um, in terms of uh, what it's saying, if the modern one is one of self-fulfillment as well as identity, like I need to be pursuit of happening, no one should tell me what to do, the Christian ethic says, it's not about self-fulfillment, but it's about self-giving. It's this radical self-giving of completely giving yourself, and that's displayed in the ultimate sense of, of marriage and in a covenant. I'm going to completely give myself. So in the modern culture of sexual ethic of self-fulfillment, uh, self-fulfillment, it leads to a hookup culture. A hook of culture, what's in it for me? And even in a mutual understanding, it's, it's a mutual as, as, long as, um, as long as it meets my needs. But as, as soon as it doesn't do that, I can just move on. In contrast, a Christian ethic says it's not mutual self-fulfillment, but it's mutual self-giving. And that is the expression of the gospel that God has given himself completely over to us. And that is ultimately love. Love is not for your self-fulfillment, but it is giving of yourself uh, to, for, for the other person. So that's one. Here's another aspect of a Christian ethic is that the sexual ethic of, of the Christian belief system is really a pointer and picture of the gospel. And the gospel says that, uh, that you have this incredible relationship between two very diverse beings, God and humanity. And what's reflected in the Christian sex ethic is you have this relationship between two different beings, male and female, in the context of mutual self-giving to one another. And so the irony is that the Christian lens and view that it's uh, uh, between a husband and a wife, it's viewed as so restrictive and narrow, and yet it is the most gender diverse. Because when you look at the creation Genesis 1 account, God says, here's how I'm going to create the world. And the way that people are going to know who I am is going to be this incredible diversity uh, taking place. So you have light and darkness. You have sun and the moon. You have a sky and the sea. You have fish and you have birds. You have male, female. He says, this is how I want the world to understand who I am because one cannot capture it all. And this Christian sexual ethic points us to that. Third thing about the Christian ethic, if it points to how in Jesus you have new life, new life, then the Christian sex ethic reflects part of that is giving new life through the physiology of a man and woman in union to bring about the flourishing of the world. You see, so at the end, the Christian uh, sex ethic is incredibly consensual. It's inc it, it, the ultimate sense of it all because you're saying in marriage, I'm consenting to give all of myself to this other person. And uh, in our culture, consensual sex is like, if you don't have that, that's evil, that's wrong. Right. But do you know that consensuality is a Christian framework? It's a Christian worldview. Before the Christian ethic came in, Roman Empire, it was all about power. And you could have sex with anyone else who was under you, under power. So what's happening is a modern view is plagiarizing. And it's borrowing, unknowingly, the Christian ethic and value system of consensus. Not, so not only is there incredible consensus, but too, there is incredible gender diversity. So... We're talking about Christianity on the margins. And if Christianity is on the margins, this is one example of that. How do us Christians respond? So let me share three things from our passage. Number one, not dismay. Not dismay, not anger, 
Not fight back. Because what do you see here? Notice that it says, God says, I took you into exile. I did this. Yeah, it was your sin, but I'm the one who brought this about. So there's a humility in the response to being in exile and being on the margins. But also there's a hopefulness. Because God is a covenant Lord. He says, before exile, in exile, after exile, I'm the sovereign Lord. I am the covenant God. That will not change. So for Christians in our cultural moment, on the margins, not dismay. But there's a humility and there's a hopefulness. Secondly, not assimilate. So Babylon wanted all the exiles here to assimilate. The way that they dominated other nations, they didn't just kill everyone and wipe them out because they knew that eventually there'll be vengeance taking place. So what they, what they, their approach was, let's assimilate everyone in. And the message was this. Hey, you people on the margins, if you want to be in the center of power, join us. You want a place of influence and power? Join and assimilate into our value system. And God speaks to them here and says, I want you to be distinct. He says, I want you to increase, not decrease. Because by assimilating to Babylon, you're going to decrease. But by keeping your distinct identity as a covenant people of God while there, you will increase. So in every host culture, there's going to be a temptation for assimilation to take place. Let me give you a couple of observations. One past and, more, and, and the second one more current. Past. The mainline church. So in the mainline church, it was this, 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 this understanding of, hey, the world, the science, and everything taking place. And if we need to be relevant and for Christians to, to Christianity to continue to thrive, let's just get rid of this belief that there's supernatural miracles. The virgin birth of Jesus. All these things that the Bible says about Scripture being um, divinely inspired by God. We don't need to do that. It's, 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 we're, Christianity is going to die out. Instead, let's get to the heart of what matters. Let's care for the poor. Let's care about justice. Let's focus on those matters which are important. You know what happened? All the mainland churches started dying. Why? Because people are saying, why do you even need the church? We could just do this on our own. In this third world culture, you're, you don't need a king. You just, just, you're, you're, you're carrying the vestiges of this kingdom. So it all began to decline. And yet all the churches that said, Jesus is the Lord in Christ. That he's come to renew absolutely everything. He's a supernatural God. All those churches began to thrive and get stronger. You know why? Because it was dressing the deep human need of suffering of meaning and purpose in life. And it began to thrive. So assimilation will lead to a form of death. No gospel. That's a past one. Here's a current one. A couple of years ago, Christianity Today came out with an article written by James Eglinton, and it was entitled, Populism versus Progressivism. Who knows best? And in it, Eglinton makes an argument that there are two Americas, and one is um, taking, is a, is a view of the group over the individual and conservation of the past, right, populism. Progressivism is individual over against the group and looking ahead to progress into the future. And in the article, he talks about these are belief systems that have a gravitational pull, and even in the context of Christians and church, to make you assimilate and join into it. And he draws upon Augustine's view of the city of God and the city of man. And he says, in the city of man, there are two districts. You have the city of progressivism and the city of populism. And there's a lot of fighting taking place, and it wants you to assimilate and bring into it. And the problem with this is that you're finding your identity, one, in individual and sexuality. Two, the other side you're finding your identity in blood, soil, nation, groups of people dismissing others. And there's no transcendence. There's no God behind it. And it's sucking you in. The problem with idols, Andy Crouch says this. I'm summarizing him. In the beginning, idols will promise to offer you everything and say that it will cost you nothing. But in the end, it will give you nothing and it will cost you everything. And so Eglinton argues that what's needed is the powerful gravitational pull, the greater of the gospel that speaks into your life, even as exiles on the margin, so that you're not assimilating 
because that is a movement and prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. We just sang that, right? Whatever it is, and the gravitational pull of the gospel to center us in. Let me share with you this one quote from uh, his article. He said this, like the city of man, the city of God exerts its own attractive power. The Christian faith is its own agenda and moves most naturally when dancing to its own tune. When the crucial distinction between city of God and city of man is recognized, Christians who find themselves as residents at either polar extremity, that's when you give into assimilation or tempted for assimilation, progressive or populist, will invariably find that they do not quite fit in. Pilgrims and sojourners who are looking for the city that is to come. Friends, may that be our description in our cultural moment. Third, so to respond, not dismay, not assimilate. The third one is not separate. So in the chapter before in Jeremiah 28, there was this prophet named Hananiah. And Hananiah was saying to everyone, oh, the exile Babylon. No, it's only going to be two years. It's not going to be bad. Uh, the Babylon's going to lose. You're going to come back. So therefore, don't get engaged. Just separate yourself out. Just forget them. Ignore them. And God says to them in that chapter, Hananiah, you are a false prophet. That is not true. And the exile is going to come. It's going to be 70 years. And listen to the words of Jeremiah. And so there's this temptation. If one is to over-engage, the other one is to under-engage completely whatsoever. And some within Christian circles might uh, listen to this and think, yeah, it's, you know, things are so bad. I feel like that's what we need to do. And my response is this. There's this book I read uh, not, too while, not too long ago, and I keep on coming back to it. It's by a book called, by Michael Kruger called Christianity at the Crossroads. And he talks about Christianity in the second century. And how that season and time is so similar to our cultural moment, where Christianity was viewed as a threat to the larger society, and it was considered even dangerous. Meaning, in the first century, oh, Christians are like that weird sect, Jewish sect there, just do their own thing, no bother. By the second century, all these Gentiles are becoming Christians. And all these Roman citizens are becoming Christians and now saying, we've got a problem now because they're saying, do not worship Caesar. We need to worship Jesus Christ as Lord. And there's persecution and tension and there's all this social upheaval taking place because in the Roman culture of that day, it was all ordered by hierarchy of power. Did you know the sexual ethic pre-Christian was all determined by power? If you were a man at the top of the ladder, you, have, you were able to have sex not only with your wife, your wife couldn't have sex with anyone else, but you would be free to have sex with anyone else, no consensus needed, with anyone else underneath your social uh, ladder. Male, woman, slave, child, boy, girl, it doesn't matter. And Christianity comes in, and it's not separated, but the reason why everything began to be transformed, because it said, no, everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone is in the image of God. So there's a value system against this power. And Christianity began to speak into it. And as a result, all of these people explosively began to come to know Jesus. Slaves, women, children. It's not about the power. And Christians uh, began to, admit, to reach out to the, the most powerless. In a Roman culture, when babies were born and the father could say, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs down, get rid of the baby. Christians stood strongly against infanticide. And so you see what's happening in the second century is they engaged, but they were distinct. And because of that engagement and not separating it, Kruger says that pivotal moment in the second century from a historical lens, Christianity could have died out or it could have moved forward. And it did. And it did because Christians were distinct, but they were also engaged in that cultural moment. So that's the first point. I know there's a lot. Understanding our cultural context, Christianity on the margins, and how to, different ways to um, not dismay, not assimilate, not separate. Let's look at then, secondly, how do we respond? And uh, what I wanted to talk about here is faithful and hopeful engagement. How Christians are to respond in our cultural moment is faithful and hopeful engagement. Let me share two quotes. I thought these were so good. My, John Mark Homer says this, bless the host culture, not from the center, but from the margins. 
Bless the host culture, not from the center, because you're going to assimilate, but from the margins. And I really like this quote from Kristen Weatherall. She said this, bloom where you are planted. Bloom where you are planted. You're in exile, bloom where you're implanted. Share a couple of verses here from verse five. Look what the Lord says through Jeremiah. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Build houses and live in them means to settle in. Be part of the community. Settle in. We have people in our church who are in the, mili- who are in the military. And you're stationed here perhaps at Pendleton or Miramar for just a couple of years. We have people here who are in residency, who, are, who have a fellowship. And you're just here maybe for a year or two, and that's it. And there's a great temptation to say, I'm not going to settle in. I don't need community. I'm just here, and I'm going to be gone anyways. Why bother? To your detriment of loneliness and isolation. And Jeremiah is saying, in exile, settle in, build houses, and live in them. And then it says, plant gardens and eat their produce. Remember, it was an agricultural society. In an agricultural society, do you know how long it took to plant gardens? All 12 months right? You got to like till the earth and you got to plant the seeds. You got to water then harvesting and then laying the line fallow. It took the entire time and eat their produce. I mean, how much, praise God for the produce of different cultures and food, right? We love different ethnic foods. He says, hey, eat their food, eat their produce, engage in that way and plant gardens and eat their produce. Verse six, Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Do you hear echoes of this earlier on? Where? In Genesis 1.28. In the creation mandate, God says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Families, go forward and bless, right? Bring, uh, be ambassadors, bringing forth blessing in my truth, goodness, and beauty, and fill the whole earth. And what God is saying is, being in exile does not give you a pass from being a blessing to everyone in the world. Continue to engage, bloom where you're planted, start the families, continue on and bless and be a blessing to the world, even if you're in exile. Last one, verse seven. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The word welfare in the Hebrew is shalom. It's such a beautiful, holistic picture. When Jesus returns, there's going to be shalom, no sin, beauty, justice, um, uh, righteousness. He says, seek the welfare, the holistic welfare of the city. Note that. Secondly, this is the second time God reminds them, I sent you here. I took you uh, into exile. Third thing, he says, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. He does not say pray to the Lord against its behalf. He says pray on its behalf. Jeremiah is saying, don't be like the prophet Jonah. Remember that guy? Right? He prayed against the behalf of Nineveh. God says, hey, I want you to preach against Nineveh. He's like, yeah, right, not them. And so he runs the opposite direction. And so God has to send his big fish, swallows him up. And he goes, fine, I'm going to go. And he finally goes to Nineveh. And what does he do? He gives like the worst sermon ever. He just says, 40 days, whatever. You know, God's going to then, oh, I'm just. And then he goes outside the city. Why? Because he doesn't want to be any part of it. He's like, he's hoping that everything will fall apart. He's outside the city. Don't be like Jonah. It's what it's saying. Pray to the Lord on its behalf and for in its welfare you will find your welfare wow that as you plant where you bloom where you're planting your soul will begin to bloom that you will begin to experience the shalom of God as you pursue and bring shalom as ambassadors of God's beauty truth and goodness yes even in Babylon. Yes, even in our Babylon. Some of you might be inspired by that. Some of you might be going, I'm not sure. You're fearful or maybe you're anxious. You're struggling with that. From a Christian lens, how can we? And we can move forward because one of the promises given that God says over and over in Scripture is, I am with you. 
I am with you in exile, outside of exile, I'm always with you. And remember the words of Jesus before he ascended. One of the words he said was, I am with you always to the end of the age. How and why is that so important? He says, I'm bringing this about, the resurrection. My resurrection and my presence is going to be with you. How does that encourage and help us to move forward? You see, Jesus Christ He came into this world as the ultimate exile, didn't he? And his whole purpose was to bring about the shalom of the entire world. And as Jesus came and lived in exile, he left his home and entered into this world. And he didn't assimilate, nor did he separate. The the Sadducees wanted the people to collaborate and to assimilate with Rome. Jesus did not do that. The zealots wanted people to separate and fight Rome. And people thought that's what Jesus the Messiah was going to do. He did not do that. And Jesus, as the ultimate exile, the one in exile, came and lived in the margins. He didn't do his ministry in the center of Rome. But he came into like these backwater towns like Galilee and Capernaum. The ultimate exile... And on the cross, what happened? Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ was crucified as he took upon our sin and our judgment outside the city. What is that about? Because he took our judgment and he was as an ultimate exile experiencing the judgment of God so that we can experience the shalom of God. He was outside the city as an exile so that you and I who are outsiders can be brought into the ultimate home of God's grace and family. And the Christian message says that center of Jesus, the exile who in his redeeming love, self-giving, not self-fulfilling love, this love that has brought and drawn you in, the gravitational force of the Holy Spirit begins to draw you in to, to bless other people and to bless even in the context of Babylon. Let me share with you this letter, this portion. It's from a letter to a man named Diognetus. And Diognetus, this is, again, 2nd century, 150 AD. Can we show it up here? 150 AD. This guy, Diognetus, was interested in Christianity. He saw all these things happening among Christians, and he's like, what is going on? And he asked someone, and I'm so thankful that this is preserved even to our day. And listen what this person says to Diognetus, written in 150 AD about Christians in that time, in the second century. Similar cultural moment as ours. They, Christians, dwell in their own countries, but only as sojourners. They bear their share in all things as citizens, and they endure all hardships as strangers. It says there, they dwell, but they're not assimilated. And they're not separated because they're there. Every foreign land is their home. They're engaged. They're planting gardens. And every home, a foreign land. This is not my true home. They marry like all other men. And they beget children. Having a family. Continuing to move forward. Being a blessing in their context of Babylon. (laughs) but they do not cast away their offspring. They have their meals in common, meaning they opened up their home and their house with everyone, but not their wives. Sexual ethic. They find themselves in the flesh, and yet they live not after the flesh. The Roman view was a very Gnostic view. Flesh was like secondary and bad. So the spiritual is really important. So it doesn't matter what you do. If you, it's sex, is like, sex is a sexual, it's an appetite. You hungry, you eat. So you could have sex, it doesn't matter. And that kind of Gnostic physical is bad. It says they find themselves in the flesh and yet they're not living after the flesh. They're not doing that because they believe in the resurrected physical body, but a holy body. Their existence is on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. Here is resilient faith in their cultural moment. 
my Christian friends. May this be our expression. May this describe us in our cultural moment. Third and lastly, how to thrive and not just survive in our cultural moment. And here I'm just going to say the four things that we're going to go through in our sermon series uh, up to Easter. Four important aspects. First, thick gospel community. Thick gospel community, because apart from thick gospel community, we're going to live in our own echo chambers. The gravitational forces of ideologies will kind of suck you in, and you're going to need the community. The Holy Spirit will use the community of God to bring the the tractor gravitational force of the gospel into the centering and the beauty of Jesus to give you wisdom and discernment. Thick gospel community that is based on covenant and commitment and not just consumer-minded. We're going to look at that. Secondly, we're going to consider the practicing the ways of Jesus. And this is not just simply, hey, just read a Bible and do your quiet time devotional for 15 minutes and you're good for the rest of the day. We're talking about spiritual practices that literally form and shape you because guess what? All of us are being formed and shaped by practices. If you're an early morning person, you get up early, you exercise, you work out, you um, watch the news, you, you read the Bible, all of that forms you. Every action we do, the number of hours you spend on social media, that forms you. It shapes your reality to think that it even bolsters more of the feelings over reality. We have to watch out for that. Christianity says the practices, our entire Christian expression by the life of the Spirit is formed and shaped by the practices of Jesus. So how can we cultivate joy and hope in a culture that cultivates hatred and division? God uses the practices of Jesus to help do that through the work of the Spirit. Next, navigating culture with biblical wisdom and truth. We're going to be talking about exactly don't be a Jonah and separate or don't assimilate either, but how can you navigate our cultural moment with biblical fidelity, wisdom, and truth? And then lastly, living as salt and light before the world. That Christians talk about the message and the hope of Jesus but we also show the message of the hope of Jesus through acts of mercy and compassion and and, and, and caring for the disenfranchised. And listen, if anything, we who are Christians who are living on the margins should have empathy, heart, and conviction to those in our society who are living on the margins because we understand that. And all four, to close it out, is it's fueled and motivated by the gospel. Romans 1, 16, 17, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. These are not just four just practices. It's fueled and motivated by the gospel. It's not us, it's the gospel. It's not us, but Jesus. Not us, but Jesus in us. A deep, robust gospel foundation and formation that works itself out in these four ways. So I'd like to close by inviting you to a time of prayer and reflection. One, would you pray and reflect how, Holy Spirit, how can you convict or correct me in light of today's message? Am I angry in my faith? Am I assimilating? Am I compromising? Am I separated? And let the Holy Spirit speak and speak into your life through his word. And secondly, can I ask you to pray for our sermon series? Will you pray for our sermon series that God would be so kind to use these next few months to use his word to develop a deep, resilient faith in our cultural moment, that we would be able to bloom where we are planted here. Would you pray that? Let's spend a moment in prayer and reflection, then I'll close and we'll sing.
Abba, Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, who came into this world, was in exile so that we could be brought home, and he is, through his resurrection, renewing everything. And in our cultural moment, Holy Spirit, would you break in to help us to have hope and be humble? Convict us if there's a sense of compromise. Engage us if there's a hardened, self-righteous attitude before the world. And I pray your spirit would infuse life and animate us to the movement of, of seeing our potential moment as an opportunity where faith will not weaken but deepen and grow because of the work of your spirit. We pray for that, and we look to you to bring that about for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I ask you to stand with me, and let's close as we sing. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, breathe new life into my willing soul. Let the presence of the risen Lord come renew my heart and make me whole cause your word to come alive in me give me faith for what i cannot see give me passion for your purity Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come abide within. May your joy be seen in all I do. Love enough to cover every sin in each thought and deed and attitude. Kindness to the greatest and the least. strivings into works of grace breath of god show christ in all i do
beauty the face of Christ may be clear for all the world to see. Are you hurting? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? is calling oh, oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and treat them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, oh, oh. oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Is any wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before.
Thank you for joining us in our worship service. Thank you for joining us as we kick off this new series. Bless, not from the center, but from the margins. Bloom where you've been planted. And we can do that because as you receive now the benediction, Jesus' blessing goes before you and is with you always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for joining us here today. God bless you.